<coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear friends. Allah bless you all. Okay, uh, let's resume uh, our look at Surah Tawbah al Fatiha. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد صلاة تفرحه وتسعده وترضيه واجزه بها عنا ما هو أهله يا أرحم الراحمين وآله وسلم اللهم زدنا ولا تنقصنا وأكرمنا ولا تهنا وأعطنا ولا تحرمنا وآثرنا ولا, ولا تؤثر علينا وأرضنا وارض عنا يا كريم so, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. We were looking at the verses in Surah Tawbah regarding the Munafiqeen, how these people just want bad things to, to, to befall the believers, and how these people were just rooted in their disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their disbelief in the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They would never believe in Allah nor in His Messenger. And what does that belief do to someone? You know, it. It makes them desire to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through many means. One of those means is the prayer. So the believer, you know, uh, yes, everyone can have, you know, moments and times when they're, when they're feeling a bit low. But, you know, a believer knows that, you know, when you stand in worship, when you perform your hajj, when you do acts of worship, that they're going to be rewarded. So there's a, desire, there's a motivation there. And these people have none of that because they don't believe in Allah. They don't believe in the last day. They chose not, not to believe it despite knowing it's true they choose not to uh, su submit to you know its implications so they don't have when they go to the prayer they go there lazily and when it comes to spending in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they do so lazily as well they don't want to spend and in fact it's, it's a burden on them and they are actively opposed to it but they have to right because they're in this situation they've been saying they're believers they've been saying we're with the muslims and everything and now <coughs> you know they have to you know <coughs> play along as they see it so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the prophet or it can be for, to the towards the believers uh he says فَلَا تُعْجِبْكَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَادُهُمْ إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ بِهَا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَتَزْهَقَ أَنفُسُهُمْ وَهُمْ كَافِرُونَ So let neither their wealth nor their children impress you, O Prophet, or O believers. Allah only intends to torment them through these things in this worldly life. Then their souls will depart while they are disbelievers. Okay. So what's being said here? So he says, فَلَا تُعْجِبْكَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَادُهُمْ عُجُب for إِعْجَاب is to be impressed or to hear فَلَا تُعْجِبْكَ uh, So the, the command is actually to uh, to the money and the children. Don't you go around impressing them, right? But what's intended is don't you be affected by them and don't, you know, speaking to the believers and the Prophet Sallallahu was above, you know, being oppressed by mere worldly things. But some of the believers were new to Iman and, you know, they didn't see the full perspective. So he's saying to them, don't, don't, don't be impressed by their wealth and their children, right? Because someone who's impressed by something, look at the people of uh, Bani Israel who saw Qarun. And, you know, Qarun was, you know, uh, you know a criminal, right? and caused a lot of harm to Bani Israel, but he had money. And then people who saw him were like, wow, you know, later than I mithla ma uti, ma, ma uti qarun, if only we had uh, the like of what he, you know, uh, had been given. And then what happened? He was destroyed. So money is not the, you know, the barometer of Allah's pleasure with someone or a person's success. So don't be impressed by that such a person because when someone's impressed, you tend to look at them with the eye of awe or you desire to be like them. So no, their wealth and their children, 
two things that the Arabs really saw status symbols, wealth and children. Their wealth and their children are actually harming them. So, <coughs> so <coughs> he says in the previous verse that they, when they spend, they do so reluctantly. They really hate giving, and they, but, but they have to give. So, part of it is Allah saying, "Innama yuridu Allahu liyuadhibahum." Biha fil hayati dunya. Clearly, obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to punish them through these things in the life of this world. So, money is it's very clear. Firstly, they're having to spend on a cause which they don't want to spend in, right? That's causing causes them pain. Secondly, they don't have the proper perspective. Someone who looks at the Akhirah, someone who looks at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his infinite generosity, the rewards he's promised looks at things with a different perspective you can have a billion pounds in your account and with that billion pounds you can buy whatever a billion will get you and at the same time uh, if there's no iman uh, then that billion is just a billion but if there's iman then you can spend that billion on things that will you know help you live a better life help your dependents live a better life, you can spend it on others, you can spend it in in general in the ways that, that Allah is pleased with. And that billion is not just a billion, it's a billion plus infinity because <laughs> the rewards that come with that, with spending it for the sake of Allah, the rewards that come not only in this life, because Allah says, whatever you spend, Allah will replace it. So not only in this life, but in the next life, the good that He brings, the, the rewards, <coughs> the high rank and ultimately the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is worth much more than the mere billion so to speak so they lose out on that right and all they have is just the things that they buy or the things that they're you know accumulating the wealth for another way that they're punished with with for it is um, punished with uh, punished by it is that they spend all the effort and energy in accumulating it the believer knows what's going to come to me is going to come to me. I'm expected to put in a certain amount of effort and beyond that what comes is will come whether it's you know a, a small amount or a large amount right because Allah has decreed what's best for me. So as we saw uh, you know a few sessions before this that um, say only that which is in our benefit will afflict us. So the believer sees this, whereas these people don't have that perspective. They spend their energy, their mental energy, their physical energy in trying to accumulate more and more and more. And then once it's here, there's the worry of keeping it, maintaining it. You know, either someone will take it, where should I keep it? I can only stick so much underneath my mattress. You know, where, where, what should we do with it? Or in our times, you know, what if its value diminishes? Right, or whatever anxiety you know, sort of someone has regarding their wealth, that's the case. It's you know, because of their disbelief, it's a punishment for them. Their children, as well, a lot of them, their children, same thing. Sons, Arabs are proud of sons, right? A lot of these people who are opposing the Prophet, you know, their sons were with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hamdullah ibn Abi Amir and Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, these two people were firm believers, whereas their fathers were, you know, disbelievers, you know, munafiqun. And so this is this is another way they punish. Secondly, so so their sons are publicly opposing them. And a man wants to have his son by his side supporting him, right? Uh, but this was not the case. So uh, a punishment, <coughs> the adab isn't necessarily just getting bloodied and, and, and bruised. It's also this in, internal pain that a person can feel. So this is what they were feeling. So, uh, and, and their sons, you know, them having to go to war, take their sons with them. Right, because oh, where Muslims are defending the Muslims, they would they'll be saying, but then when they have to go to war, they risk themselves and their sons. That worry, that concern. Whereas the other believers, that's you know, when they went to a military campaign, they would be, you know, they there's normal human anxiety, but then they were like, you know, uh, you know, the ihdil husnayin, one of the two good things, right? They were expecting victory or, uh, you know, martyrdom. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that He's punishing them through these things. So then he says, Fil hayati dunya, in the life of this world, in the mere meager life of 
this world a dunya literally doesn't mean the world but it means the closest thing so the life that's closest because it's the most immediate to their perception to their understanding they can't look beyond it they can't think beyond it this is a sign of intelligence someone who can think you know do you want one cookie now or five later right and you know someone who's not intelligent will just take one now and just sit there later staring at other people's faces whilst they're having their five cookies <coughs> so because this is all they care about the life of this world even though the haya in the the life the mere meager the paltry life of this world it, it really diminishes you know the the expression uh, of life here and he says so all that Allah is punishing them you know, he asked what Allah wants the supreme king because they've opposed him he wants this he wills this to happen to them what does haqa and fusuhum wa hum kafirun and for their souls to leave meaning their souls to depart their bodies whilst not while they are but whilst they are firm rooted disbelievers and so because their disbelief is so strong and rooted their class is kafirun but does haqa zuhuq or zahuq this word it has a few implications it's for something to pass by or go to depart to to become distant uh, for something to leave but in a way that it's beyond your control and in a way that's difficult so their souls leave what causing them pain as opposed to the believer when he's dying he sees the reward that's promised for him in the akhirah and that gives him some consolation and death is made easier whereas with these people they're shown their punishment so their souls you know as we see in that surah where the souls are ripped out with you know the feeling difficulty also it comes at a time in a way they can't control practically everyone um apart from the believer who's expecting to meet Allah and looking forward to it everyone else is what you know when they're dying they're like oh no I wish I had more time right even the disbeliever none of the disbelievers say yeah fine I'm ready for the punishment bring it on they're all seeing and they think oh no I wish I could go back and change my ways when they're in the hellfire they're saying the same thing so uh, when it's beyond their control and the soul is leaving that's also part of the punishment Allah is making them die as disbelievers why there are consequences to existing there are consequences to rejecting God it's their own choice and then they have to face its consequences and this is how it works you know so th this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says so then he says وَيَحْلِفُونَ بِاللَّهِ <coughs> And they keep swearing by Allah, by Allah, the Supreme King. إِنَّهُمْ لَمِنْكُمْ They swear by Allah that they're part of you, of you, amongst you. وَمَا هُمْ مِنْكُمْ Whilst they're not with you, from you. وَلَكِنَّهُمْ قَوْمٌ يَفْرَقُونَ But rather they're a people who are, who only say so out of fear. So he says, وَيَحْلِفُونَ <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says as well, اتخذوا ايمانهم جنة They took their oaths as shields. They used their oaths as shields to protect themselves from the consequences of their disbelief in this life. So he says, وَيَحْلِفُونَ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّهُمْ مِنْكُمْ They swear by God that they are from you, like literally a part of you. Like if you had to pull out one of the muscles of your arm, he says, this is part of me, right? then reattach it like a Lego piece if you can <laughs> you know but uh, it's a part of you right <clears throat> you know you don't get someone saying um, uh, I love everything about you except for your heart unless you mean it metaphorically or except for your left lung your left lung you know just disgusts me you can say what what's my left lung done to you it's a part of me so they're saying we're so there's so much love and fraternity and brotherhood and affection between us we're each uh, we're all one thing we're part of you lies right saying that they were, were such strong believers minkum and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negates it with a strong nominal sentence they use a, an oath in the nominal sentence Allah uses a, nom a nominal sentence to negate it completely minkum. but they're not from you they're not a part of you at all but rather what, what is it hum qawm walakinnahum qawmun so we talked about qawm uh, people of strength with the capacity and the potential to do a lot of 
a, a lot of good or a lot of bad, whichever way they direct their efforts. And Yafraqoon, people who, uh, these people, they're in fear and they could have done a lot of good, but because they haven't now, they're in a lot of fear. Why? Because they saw that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in what, six years, he went from <clears throat> leading, you know, a real small group, 300 odd people were at the Battle of Badr, although that wasn't all the believers, but just a small group of believers. And now practically the entirety of the Arabian Peninsula have accepted Islam, uh, all the clients of the of the Muslims and, you know, living in, in, in with an agreement with them. And so these people are seeing that, you know, they, they chose the wrong way back then. And now obviously they think, oh, well, I can't, I can't change now. But they chose the wrong approach back then. And now the tables have turned. The, the believers who they thought would be weakened, you know, um, persecuted, are now actually the, the power in the land. So what are they going to do about it? You know, so they, these people are afraid. What if their disbelief becomes known? What will be done to them? Especially seeing as they've been opposing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, subtly trying to undermine his efforts, trying to get people to attack the Muslims, all of these things, they all did that. So, you know, they're in a state of fear. So then we have this next, which is, Yafraqoon present tense continuously in fear. The next verse is very beautiful. He says, لَوْ يَجِدُونَ مَلْجَأً أَوْ مَغَارَاتٍ أَوْ مُدَّخَلًا لَوَلَّوْا إِلَيْهِ وَهُمْ يَجْمَحُونَ Really eloquent. Incredibly eloquent. Especially just that last word is just like, wow. So he says, لَوْ يَجِدُونَ If only they could find, meaning they're trying to find a way out of their situation, if only they could find a refuge or a cave or a hiding, any hiding place, they would rush headlong towards it. <coughs> Meaning they're scared, they want to get out of their situation, they're afraid of what's going to happen, they're afraid of what will happen if they get caught, they're afraid of the believers, they're afraid of the consequences of their actions and choices. What if we get found out? What if the disbelievers come and say, yeah, those people were supporting us all the time, the entire time. <coughs> so they want to get out of the situation because they're afraid of the, you know, afraid of what could be uh, happen to them, what could happen to them. So he says, لَوْ يَجِدُونَ مَلْجَأً If only they could find a place of refuge, meaning it's, it's almost as though they, they're looking but they can't find. They thought about this, this option and that option and this possibility and that scenario. There's nowhere for them to go. لَوْ يَجِدُونَ مَلْجَأً If only they could find a place of refuge, a place they could go to for safety, shelter and protection. But there is nowhere. The, almost the entirety of Arabia is, has accepted Islam or is, was with the Muslims at this point. So what are they going to do? <laughs> right? <coughs> oh, مَغَارَاتٍ If they only they could find a place of refuge or caves. Magara is a singular, magara plural. It's a cave either either in a mountain or a subterranean cave which has a, a wide entrance right so a big place a group could go in like that if need be but it has a wide entrance so they could go in there and hide and just live out the rest of their days like that so they don't have to face you know getting exposed and then you know either being put to death or uh, or something like that you know they were just afraid Oh, mudakhalan. Oh, a mudakhal. A mudakhal is the same as a cave, but the, the in this situation, the you can mudakhal. You can see with the the word the uh, here. Uh, it's the entrance is tight and constricted. It's really hard to to squeeze in. So even that would like give us some a degree of protection, right? But they were trying to find anything like an underground hole of an animal where they could just go in and squeeze in. Uh, and stay there. So Allah is just showing, you know, just how desperate they were to get out of their situation. Look how it's changed. They would walk around trying to, you know, cause harm to the believers, trying to get the, the Jews of Medina to harm the believers or the pagan Arabs. And now they're in a situation where practically you know, all the opposition has evaporated and these people have nowhere to go. And uh, so it says, if only they could find one of these sources of uh, refuge, they would have turned around and gone run straight towards it. Wahum Yajmahun rush headlong towards it. Let's Yajmahun. Let's look at this word. Uh, the root word it comes from Jamuh, right? Uh, or Jimah, which is um, a horse that's being recalcitrant, rebellious, right? Um, I saw one recently. Um, 
in Egypt, Egypt, and he was just being really aggressive with the owner. And then he said to me, "Oh, it's it's a nice horse. It won't do anything to you." I was like, "Yeah," <laughs> but you know, horses, the big animals, either it's <coughs> it's being stubborn and rebellious, just just not listening to the owner. So it's either running away, running off, and no matter how much you pull its reins or get it to slow down or pull it, it won't listen. Or it's you know throw you know throwing its feet into the air trying to throw the rider off. It's it's like this. And one of the poets he said, "Man li bi rad jamahi min ghawayatiha, kama yurad jamah al khayli bil lujumi." Who is there to to restrain my wayward ego from its uh, from its wrong ways, its bad ways? Saying his ego is doing all these bad things, he can't stop it. Who's there that can help him? Just like a horse is reined in, you know, restrained uh, with its reins, and so he's saying that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is saying that if only they could find a place like this, they would turn around and run towards it, and not listening, not caring, not not heeding any advice, people calling out, people even dragging them, trying to get them to stop, they wouldn't. They just keep running. Very eloquent way of putting it, like you know, the, the depth of fear that they had. Uh, in their situation, but they brought it on themselves, right? This is exactly uh, what he's saying. Wahum uh, yajmahun again and again and again, and that's their way, right? This is what they would have done. Uh, I mean, the, the whole thing was based on cowardice in the first place. At least the disbelievers took a stance to that, you know, they're opposing. These people just hid, you know. <clears throat> and then now we have another group of uh, these munafiqun, you know, th those who wish harm on the believers. And you know what evil and you know, difficulties to befall them. So you've got this group, women whom man yal mizuka fi sadaqat, and amongst them there are some of them who are critical of your distribution of alms or profit. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Charity, the zakat. For in u'atu minha radu, wa in lam yu'atu minha ida hum yaschatun. Okay. So he says, uh, if they're given from them some of it, they're pleased. But if they're not, they're enraged. So let's look at this. He says, "Women whom amongst them, man yel mizuka fi sadaqat, those who secretly uh, insult you regarding the sadaqat, as Abu Saud says, that they don't have the nerve to say it publicly, they do it privately, and they're insulting the messenger. There are situations where people did do this publicly, like the story of Dhul Khuwaisira, this man who said about to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was distributing things at the battle of, after the battle of Hunain that this is distribution that Allah's Allah's pleasure is not sought by it, meaning you're trying to please people and not Allah, seeing He's being unfair. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the furthest of any of Allah's creation from being unfair. Allah loves those who are fair and you know upright and you know and just and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam embodied this quality in in the most perfect form uh, as we can see with his life with his spouses with um with the sahaba he was just he was fair through and through right sallallahu alaihi wasallam so their accusation is false whether those those who did it publicly like the khawaisara or uh, abul jawad uh, who Abu Saud says this man, uh, you know, he was saying, you know, he he's giving it to those shepherds, those people who herd sheep, uh, you know, and so he, he's not fair. Meaning, why isn't he giving it to us? So he says, <coughs> in the sadaqat. So this word sadaqat in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you find its usage really referring to zakat what we now refer to zakat but also sadaqa charity also applies so he says for in u'atu minha radu you know if they're given from it they're pleased right wa in lam yu'atu minha idha hum yaskhatun then and if they're not uh, given if they're not given from it something of it idha suddenly right immediately you could say immediately like it's like you know someone who's like seems calm and then something doesn't go their way and then they just become enraged and start yelling and shouting and so they become they become bitter they become angry and your uh, home nominal sentence yes again and again and again and again which indicates a couple of things one that they're always angry they're always bitter they're always you know with this foul temperament and it's always directed at the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that them being pleased and you know happy 
it's something rare like when they get something it does not their their default way of being the default way of being is being angry and bitter towards Allah and his messenger and this is how they were you know why did I get this thing I deserve this thing and no like Allah can give what he wants to whoever he wants who are you to question it and the same with the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he was free to give whatever he wanted to whoever he wanted and but despite that he was fair and he also always gave it in you know for the betterment and benefit of people how many a person there was whose <coughs> you know whose faith was shaky and the prophet gave him some some of this sadaqat and he helped his iman significantly whereas these people who were just there you know just wanted to uh, you know have their pockets filled and uh, one of the scholars of islam later talked about you know uh, you know he actually he said that you know if you look at the qualities of a dog you know if you give a dog something he'll be happy he'll pant you know he'll have, enjoy the bone or whatever but if you don't they don't come start barking at you why didn't you give me this so these people had a very low quality of you know just being bitter because you know because they didn't get something they wanted a'udhu billah right Allah protect us but this is you know this is uh, what it was that you know they'll be temporarily appeased if something's given to them but otherwise if it's given to someone who's actually who's more deserving then the anger and the bitterness shows through once again a'udhu billah so we'll stop here and then we'll continue uh, from this point and we'll look at you know, what Allah says about them and you know, what and what He teaches the believers to be like, and then uh, which leads us nicely into the verse regarding uh, zakat and who's who's given what in zakat. Okay, Allah bless you all. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.